so hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, second meeting of our series of seminars uh, regarding the topic of just wars in history. My name is Alessio Orlandi. I am a master's degree student at the University of Bologna and member, of course, of the staff of Casus Belli. Before introducing our guests of today, uh, briefly, I wanted to remind you that our next meeting will be held on Friday the 20th, and we will have the pleasure to talk with Antonello Mori and Antonio Seneca, uh, two alumni of the University Federico II of Naples, and the name of the conference will be Guerra Giusta, Giusta Guerra. In case, in addition, in case you missed our previous and first seminar, the one of last week, uh, you can easily find it on our YouTube and Facebook channels. So uh, in case you missed it, uh, be sure to go and have a look at that. Um, today, I'm here to moderate this conference and to introduce you the two brilliant scholars that are going to speak and present their works today. Um, I will start off with uh, Professor Despina Yossi, um, good evening, Professor, and thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to have you. Um, Professor Yossif got her uh, PhD at the University College of London with a thesis on the attitudes that early Christians had towards war, violence, and military service, uh, which are also topics uh, closely related to the um, speech that she will present today, uh, named uh, One is Not Supposed to Kill But, Early Christian Canons on Just Wars. Uh, since 2007, Dr. Yusuf is a professor at the college here in Athens, and she teaches two undergraduate courses at the Department of Religion. Uh, previously, she had also taught at the Hellenic Open University and at the University of Crete. Uh, she has issued and contributed to the publication of many different books and articles, and we will have the pleasure to talk with her today for a while, so I don't want to steal too much time. Uh, professor Yusuf, tell me if you want to add something. Okay, thank you. And uh, so I move on to the next uh, guest of today, which is uh, Dr. Rory Cox. Uh, welcome to you too, Professor Cox, and thank you so much for being here. Um, Dr. Cox is going to present a speech today on ideas of just war in ancient Hittite and Israeli sources. So we will probably start off our conference with his presentation today in order to have a sort of chronological continuity. Uh, he is currently a lecturer in late medieval history at the School of History of um, the University of St. Andrews. Uh, previously, he has been a lecturer in late medieval history at the Avery Street University. And uh, as Dr. Yusuf, of course, he has published many articles and books, and in particular, a book containing some of the themes he will briefly outline today um, will be issued next summer winter. It's called The Origins of Just War. Uh, so we will keep an eye on that, of course. So and I remind you that uh, um, we will have the two presentations and subsequently a moment for questions and discussion. Uh, so now if the two guests do not have anything to add, I would uh, leave the floor to Dr. Cox and thank you all again for being here and wish you all a pleasant seminar. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for having me. It's a real pleasure to, to be speaking to you all. It's also nice to know with uh, uh, Professor Yosif, um, I did my bachelor's and my master's degree at UCL as well. So we have a, a common uh, alma mater. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, just war thought in, in ancient Hatti and in ancient Israelite um, culture, as we know it through the Tanakh. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen for a PowerPoint. So hopefully that is going to work. Oh, no, that's not. Screen sharing. Stop sharing. Sorry. Basic. Microsoft PowerPoint. Okay. Can everybody, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if, if, if anything goes wrong with the slides, or if they're not, you know, carrying forward, do just feel free to uh, interrupt me. Um, so as uh, Alessia mentioned, this this is part of a, a book that I'm working on at the moment. I've been working on for the, about the, the last um, five or six years, actually, called Origins of the Just War. And um, the original idea for this book that I pitched to um, Princeton University Press was 
was that I'd write a big kind of accessible history of the just war from the ancient world all the way to the end of the Middle Ages. I'm actually a medieval historian um, uh, by training, as it were, although I did my first degree in ancient history. So I've always looked both backwards and forwards in time. And I thought, OK, well, I know the medieval stuff and I have a pretty good idea of the Greco-Roman stuff. But what about the Near Eastern stuff? I, you know, I'll, I'll spend a year researching that and that should be plenty. And that can do, you know, for the first chapter of this big kind of uh, long book. Um, but the problem is I got completely stuck <laughs> in the ancient Near East and kind of five years later, I haven't actually got out of it. Uh, and that's mainly because there's just so much to talk about. I, and actually there was far more evidence than I ever expected, particularly in uh, ancient Egyptian sources um, and ancient Hittite sources, and of course, Israelite sources or Israelite history as well. So now really the book is, is, is purely about the ancient Near East and, and Eastern Mediterranean, and really doesn't go much beyond the first century uh, CE. <laughs> So, uh, so the book has changed quite a lot, and that's really a, a result of, of the evidence and, and, and how few people have actually really taken a look at it, other than the Israelites. Um, so I, I've published something on Egypt already, and, and I said today I, I want to consider Hittite and, and Israelite. So, okay. So is that, can you all see a map now? Yep, great. So I... Most people probably won't be too familiar with, with the Hittites or, or the, uh, the Kingdom of Hatti. In terms of the chronology, where it, this is a late Bronze Age uh, kingdom and empire. It really flourishes from probably around 1700 to 1200 BCE. It pretty much collapses around 1200 BCE. Um, its early rulers uh, are referred to as Labana the first or Hattushili the first. They may be the same person. But it really reaches its height at the beginning of the 14th century under a ruler named Superluliuma the first. The Hittites have the best names. So it's yeah, Superluliuma the first kind of carves out this increasingly large territory. And you can see that here on the map. It's essentially most of modern day Turkey, right down into what is now um, northern Syria, um, Lebanon, and, and right down the Levant and parts of Iraq as well. Um, and really, this is a, a quite a, a decentralized system, more of a federal system, I suppose you would call it, um, but with this great king at the top. Um, quite remarkable for its religious tolerance. Um, it's known as the land of a thousand gods. And as I said, this empire falls eventually around 1200 as, as part of a kind of a wave of political disintegration in the region associated with the, the, the sea peoples, as, as they're called. And just a, another little map here of um, a, a kind of highlight of, of the, 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 the empire at its height, as it were. And you can see uh, right in the center, Hattusha. You can just, it's, it's a, where you see upper land and Hatti in bold. In between that, you can see Hattusha. And that was the capital of the Hittite kingdom. And this is the site that still remains of Hattusha, um, modern Bogashkale in Turkey. And there's actually quite extensive remains. It, was, it must have been quite a large city, extremely well fortified, very thick walls. And you can see the outlines of some of those walls that survive. And it kind of composed of two segments of a city, a kind of acropolis. You can see that kind of in the center rear of the picture and, and a large city surrounding it. You can also just, if we go back to the first map, you can see the major competitors for the Hittite Empire. To the south, obviously Egypt, and, and Egypt was always pushing up the Levant and into Syria, Palestine itself. And at various times, the Assyrians and also the Hurrians, the, the, the Empire of Mitanni as well. In terms of sources, um, there's not only extensive archeological evidence, as you can see from the remains of Hattusha itself, but we have a lot of textual sources. Um, and while the Hittite language itself wasn't deciphered until really quite late, not fully deciphered until 1915 really, um, and actually there's a, a hieroglyphic script which remains to be fully deciphered, we have found an extensive um, archive um, at Hattusha, probably is comprises really one of the oldest 
libraries in the world. Lots and lots of clay tablets that include historical narratives, um, kind of the deeds and the annals of kings, literary compositions, myths, uh, hymns, proverbs, uh, prayers to gods, um, descriptions of religious ceremonies, lots and lots of administrative records. Um, crucially and really interestingly, we, they have, we had found the largest single corpus from the ancient world of diplomatic treaties. So almost 25 diplomatic treaties signed with usually vassal states, but some parity states as well. So it's kind of with Egypt, in other words. Most of these are written in Akkadian, which was the kind of the lingua franca of the ancient Near East, the Babylonian Akkadian. Some of them are written in Hittite in cuneiform, and some, as I said, are written in Hittite hieroglyphs. We also have a collection of laws, the so-called Hittite law code, which was probably written down around 1300. And this is a series of case law. And actually the Hittite law code is really important because uh, particularly after a study by a chap called Mendenhall called Law and Covenant in Israel and the Ancient Near East, it, the, the influence of the Hittite law code has been pretty much conclusively shown to have heavily, heavily influenced the covenant code of Israel as well as the Deuteronomic code um, as well, and, and, the, and, the, and the Decalogue. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of influence from the Hittites filtering through the ancient Near East. But we also have over 3000 tablets found at other sites such as Ugarit, and most of these have yet to be translated. So we have a huge variety of sources for the Hittites um, and in, an increasingly large body of them actually. In terms of Israel, then, Israel should be a little bit more familiar to people, of course. Um, in terms of its chronology, this is, a, a, this is a difficult thing, because according to the Tanakh, the, which is the, the Hebrew Bible, Exodus takes place around uh, 1500 BCE, 1496 to be exact. The conquest of Canaan under Joshua begins in 1456. The United Monarchy under King Saul, King, uh, King David, King Solomon. This is supposed to have lasted from about 1080 to 930. The fall of the Kingdom of Samaria happens in 721, and the fall of the Kingdom of Judah occurs in 586. So that's the, that's the, that's the chronology according to the Tanakh. Unfortunately, there's very little other evidence to back that up. There's absolutely no explicit evidence uh, for a united Solomonic kingdom of Israel existing in the 10th century. And if we think that Israel is one of the most heavily excavated regions in the world, that, that perhaps should give us pause for thought. And there's also no archeological evidence for a sophisticated or powerful kingdom in Judah or Samaria prior to the 9th century. In terms of the, the geography, we can, you can see here roughly where the Kingdom of Israel in the north and the Kingdom of Judah existed. Um, I'm going to refer to the Kingdom of Israel as the Kingdom of Samaria because it just helps differentiate between Israel as a kind of a united entity under David and Solomon and the two what we might think of as historical kingdoms, we know that they existed, of Samaria, the capital of the Kingdom, Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. Uh, like I said, other than the, the word of the Tanakh, we have no explicit evidence that this United Kingdom of Israel actually existed. Um, a few perhaps clues. Likewise, so then what sources do we have for Israel? Well, like I said, outside of the Tanakh, there is actually very little. If we didn't have the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites would probably be no more than a footnote in, in history. Uh, uh, that, you know, and, and actually, Places like the Kingdom of Moab or the Kingdom of Edom, which you can see on the right hand map there, would be probably more famous because uh, we know more about them. So there is a very brief mention of Israel, although the translation is contested, in a 13th century stella um, erected by the Pharaoh Mernatar when he's talking about his conquests in Canaan. So that's the earliest reference we have to anything to do with Israel or Israelites. It's not clear whether it's a people or a territory though. We then have to wait really quite a long time until the second half of the ninth century, so around 850 to 830 BCE, 
for two other stele to emerge. One is a stele from Tel Dan called um, uh, the, the Israel Stella as well, or the Tel Dan Stella. And this was probably erected by the King of Aram. And this refers to him killing a King of Israel. And when he, and by the ninth century, when they say the King of Israel, they mean the King of Samaria, the, this Northern Kingdom. A more extensive source is the Moabite stone or the Mesha Stele, another victory stella erected by King Mesha, who was King of Moab. And Mesha claims to have attacked and sacked the Israelite cities of Ataroth and Nebo, massacring several thousand men and women and taking the vessels of Yahweh to the, his own god, Ashtar Kemosh. And so the Moabite stone is not only our kind of our earliest extensive um, reference to Israel or, or the Israelites, I should say, um, outside of the Tanakh, it's also the oldest unequivocal reference to Yahweh outside of the Tanakh. We then have a handful of Assyrian sources from the 9th and 8th centuries that again refer to the land of Omri, which is the kingdom of Samaria or the house of Omri. This was the dynastic house of, of Samaria. And they also, a few references to the kings of Judah. And so, so basically we have, you know, maybe fewer than 10 um, references to the Israelites really, uh, secure references to the Israelites outside of the Tanakh. So what about the Tanakh itself then? Well, like I said, we're, we're almost entirely dependent on this document, which you know, in the West, we usually refer to as the Old Testament, growing up in a Christian tradition, but you know, more properly the Hebrew Bible or, or the Tanakh in its Hebrew name. Now, this is an incredibly complex collection of texts. To give you some impression, it's twice the length of Herodotus's histories, and it's composed by multiple authors multiple redactors and editors. And it, it represents at least four different authorial traditions, but actually much more. And so when we're talking about this text, it, it, every, it should always be borne in mind that there's no simple or definitive statements that can be made about it. The archeological evidence rarely fits the narrative and the proposed timeline. In fact, it often flatly contradicts it. For example, Jericho didn't have any walls in the late Bronze Age when the so-called trumpets of the Israelites are meant to have collapsed the walls. Um, and so there's a problem there. And one analogy that the, the scholar Donald Redford makes is that reconstructing Israelite history based on the Tanakh would be like reconstructing British history based on Arthurian legends. So, you know, the, the, it's kind of that problematic. And of course, the theological commitments of the three Abrahamic faiths um, have also kind of colored analysis to a massive extent. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation and a lot of, you know, attempts to make their evidence fit the theory rather than the other way around. But undoubtedly, parts of this text are very ancient. Um, the Decalogue and the Song of Deborah probably originate in the late second millennium. Um, in contrast, there are many later editions and revisions that can be dated to the first or even the seventh century common era. Taken as a whole, we're probably talking about a text that coalesces in the period between the fall of Samaria in, seven, uh, in, in 721, really accelerates after the conquest of Judah in 586, and then probably comes together on the whole during the Persian period of the fifth and fourth centuries. So that's basically the first half of the second temple. So if we, if we, say, if we roughly say 700 to 400, that's probably the period where most of the Tanakh as we know it now comes together. Okay, so that's kind of a brief outline of the sources. Um, there's, you know, I could speak about the, the Tanakh and, and, and biblical criticism all day, but that we're not here to talk about that. So I want to argue that the, the Hittites uh, of the second millennium and the Israelites of the first millennium really possessed a way of thinking about war that we can identify as jus ad bellum traditions. Now, given the time constraints, I'm actually just going to focus on the concept of just cause. Um, and I'll discuss Hattie first. Then I'll go on to discuss Israel and give you some examples um, and then draw some conclusions. I won't have time to talk about issues of authority or intention or Yusin Bello norms, but I'm happy to, to answer questions about those afterwards. Okay, so what about Hattie first? 
Well, the Hittites do appear to have been concerned that their wars were just and had the support of gods. May basically because if they didn't, then defeat was almost inevitable. And these are some of the just causes that can be seen in Hittite texts. Now, of course, asserting that there should be a cause for war at all is actually an essential first step towards thinking ethically about war, because it implies, A, that war requires a cause, and it's not simply just a pleasure or a kind of a feckless pastime. B, it shows that war is not wholly inevitable, that if injuries are avoided, then there shouldn't really be a reason to go to war in the first place. And C, it shows a process of categorization of licit and illicit actions, whereby some actions or injuries perhaps necessitate a military response, while others are deemed less serious or, or better resolved via alternative means or, or processes. So these are the main causes for war that emerge in Hattie, self-defense uh, and the defense of borders, the defense of allies, the restitution of property, vengeance, this is particularly important in both Hitti, Hattie and Israel, uh, for direct injury and vengeance for the gods, and vengeance or punitive warfare for breaking treaty oaths. We might think of that as rebellion if the, if the oath is a vassalage oath as well. So um, let's start thinking first then again about self-defense. So from the very earliest evidence of Hittite warfare, we can see clear expressions of Hittite kings waging war in response to what they considered direct injuries or threats or incursions into their territory. Now, very often this included references to the perennial enemies of the Hattai, and this were the Kaska or the Gaska tribes of northeastern Anatolia. And these were really kind of a nomadic, highly mobile um, uh, uh, peoples of northern Anatolia on the whole, northern and eastern Anatolia, who constantly kind of raided the Hittite heartland. And there's numerous complaints about these peoples um, uh, made to the gods and, and how they, and, and, and numerous kind of almost annual campaigns launched against them. And there's just one here from a prayer of Anuanda. From a royal letter from the king to a Kasu, who was a regional governor, you can see this translating into actual military action. So the king writes, concerning the matters about which you wrote to me, how the enemy is damaging the crops, how in Kupashir he has attacked the property of the queen, how they have taken a team of oxen belonging to the house of the queen, etc., etc. Because of the because the enemy marches into the land at a moment's notice, you should locate him somewhere, you should attack him. OK, so a clear listing of the injuries that they're suffering, a clear sense of defensive violence being necessary in response. So Hittite kings saw a very straightforward relationship between kind of aggressive actions committed against the Hittite state and the legitimacy of aggressive military responses in order to defend Hittite interests. And actually, more than this, it was seen as the, the duty of the king to act in this way. The king was seen as, as a, almost like a caretaker of the land of Hatti, in, uh, installed by the gods of Hatti. So it was very much his duty to defend his land and to defend his subjects. In terms of this, the, this kind of defense of the, the, the physical land, you can see here um, from one of Mershili, uh, a, and he, he, he writes a number of plague prayers um, in other words, prayers to relieve a plague that Hattie is suffering for a number of decades. And, and through this, we get quite um, a lot of historical information. And again, you can see this idea about the defense of borders when he's talking about his father. And because Hattie was attacked by the enemy and the enemy had taken borderlands of Hattie, my father kept attacking the enemy lands and kept defeating them. He took back the borderlands of Hattie, which the enemy had taken and resettled them. He sustained Hattie and secured its borders on each side. So again, very kind of clear, um, you know, unambiguous sense of our territory was invaded. We had to do something about that. We went and conquered it. And this is, seems a good thing. It's presented to the gods 
as a kind of a, a positive action. This also extended to defense of allies. Like I said, we have this huge corpus of diplomatic treaties. And in the, the, the kind of the prologue to most of these treaties, we get a historical account of the relationship between Hatti and the state uh, that is signing the treaty. And actually this is some, some one of our, our kind of our best evidence for Hittite history comes from. And they're full of these lovely details that if you're interested in warfare and ideas of justice and law, then they're a real wealth of evidence. And not only do um, Hittite kings feel a duty to defend their allies, um, there's, a, there's a kind of a common clause of mutual defense and offense in most of these treaties that says, you know, X power shall be at peace with my friend and hostile to my enemy. So it's like, you know, my enemy is your enemy, my friend is your friend. And there's a commitment there to act. But this, these examples, Tutalia II and Supaluliuma I, in two separate treaties with uh, Kizuwatna and Mitani, even kind of claim that they've liberated peoples in their action. Okay, so it says the land of Kizuwatna rejoiced exceedingly over its liberation. Now Hati and the land of Kizuwatna are indeed free from the oaths. Um, so this is the rule of Huri, this is Matani. I, my majesty, have now given the population of the land of Kizuwatna freedom. So basically, this is talking about how Hati has essentially relieved um, Kizuwatna of an oppressive Matanian overlordship, the Matani being one of the key competitors of Hati. Um, in the second example, Sufpaluliuma, these troops and those lands I overpowered and I returned to Hati. I freed the lands which I captured. They dwelt in their places. All the people whom I released rejoined their peoples and happy, Hatti incorporated their territories. So, you know, they're really kind of displaying Hittite military power, um, not only in a kind of very positive way, but as, as, as yeah, kind of like, as a like, kind of liberating force, which is really uh, unique. One of the other key components and, and, and interesting components of just war or cause of war in, in Hittite thought was the restitution of property. So, like I said, you know, all of these ancient states were engaged in raiding. Plunder was a major um, motivator of war, I suppose, in many ways. And so a lot of warfare was waged reactively to, 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 to find plunder in response or, or to, to retake your property. And actually some of the oldest evidence we have from Hattie points towards a very strongly held belief that armed violence was a legitimate method for restoring stolen property or seeking compensation for property that had been destroyed. And actually that itself was based on a legal system that operated on a combination of vindictive and compensatory principles. So in other words, if you look at the Hittite law code, most of these ideas of restitution of property can be found on a sort of a, you know, kind of a public law level, as well as a, what we might think of as an international law level dealing with war. Old Kingdom treaties, so this is going all the way back to the 17th and 16th centuries BCE, Old Kingdom treaties created between Hatti and, and bordering independent kingdoms were very clear to stipulate a process for resolving cross-border transgressions and compensations and punishments. And this was a way to try to avoid war for the restitution of property. However, if that wasn't possible, um, then, then war it was. And actually uh, quite unusually, and you can see here in this deed of Supaluliuma I, uh, so one of his, um, uh, his um, actual annals, as it were, if anything was found when you went to war against the enemy that had originally belonged to a Hittite owner, it was actually returned to the original owner. We have several bits of evidence indicating this. Um, so you can see here that when my father arrived in the country, he found that the Gashkian, so this is the Kaska, had come inside the land of Hatti and had treated the land very badly. And the Gashkean enemy whom my father met inside the country consisted of 12 tribes. The gods helped my father so that he slew the aforementioned Gashkean enemy, the tribal troops, wherever he caught them. And what he held 
that my father took away from him and gave back to the Hittites. And there's other evidence that actually shows, it seems that essentially that the, the plunder was taken back and displayed in Hattusha. And, and if you kind of saw something that was yours that had been plundered by the enemy, you could make a claim to it. So we're not actually quite sure how this process of reclamation functioned in practice, but even the, but the fact of it, its existence at all is really quite remarkable um, and actually is indicative of the seriousness with which Hittites treated legal property ownership. It's an incredibly legalistic culture in Hattie. Like I mentioned, vengeance is also a, a prime cause for war. And vengeance was often sought in response to enemy actions that had inflicted injuries on Hittite territory or Hittite subjects or Hittite property. Vengeance was also aimed at punishing the violation of treaty oaths, um, and that seems particularly common. And the, the, the vengeance for treaty oaths is, is, is particularly interesting because it wasn't only seen as a political injury and a kind of a slight against the Hittite king, but it also implied an insult to the gods because it was the gods who acted as witnesses to the oaths and the protectors of justice as contained in the treaties. So when you signed a treaty, you know, the oaths would be made to numerous gods. And so breaking that oath was to invite retribution from the gods. A real kind of paradigmatic case of war for vengeance, and actually one of the sort of most intriguing, came about after the assassination of a Hittite prince, Zenansa, by the Egyptians. So this actually brought, so uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of Tutankhamun, um, the, the kind of the boy king with the famous death mask. So his widow, Amun, actually sought um, a Hittite prince to marry after Tutankhamun's death. And she basically did this in order to try and protect herself because Tutankhamun may well have been assassinated himself. And this was actually, if it had come off, it would have been a remarkable twist in ancient Near Eastern history because you would have had a Hittite prince becoming Pharaoh of Egypt. Unfortunately for Zenansa, and uh, his father, Superluliuma, who was very suspicious at first about this uh, and was wondering uh, what this, you know, why, why this offer was being made. Um, when Zenansa eventually went to Egypt to marry Ang Sunamun, he, he never made it. He was assassinated on the road to Egypt, almost certainly by operators within the Egyptian state who wanted to seize power after Tutankhamun's death. So uh, Superluliuma obviously was not particularly happy about this. And, and you can really sort of see here, I apologize, I can just see there's a, a slight typo. So it should be when they brought this tablet, this is the messengers, when they brought this tablet, they spoke thus, the people of Egypt killed Zenansa and brought word Zenansa died. And when my father heard of the slaying of Zenansa, he began to lament for Zenansa and he spoke thus, O oh gods, I did no evil, yet the people of Egypt did this to me. And they also attacked the frontier of my country. So the murder of his sons and answer is presented as unequivocally evil, an unjust act committed against Hattie without any provocation. And, and worse, like during it kind of broached trust. And so Superluliuma saw immediate vengeance and he attacks um, and defeats a number of Egyptian armies in Egyptian territories in Syria, Palestine, and he enslaves thousands of prisoners of war. Ironically, it's the prisoners of war he captures on this campaign who actually carry the plague back to Hatti, uh, which, which we mentioned earlier with Mercilli's plague prayers. In terms of breaking treaty oaths and, and the vengeance that was necessary there, again, we have a couple of examples here and there really are numerous examples of this. Uh, this is a, a treaty between Tuthalia IV and Shashkamua of Amaru. And this really has a very clear sense of A, injury, B, vengeance, and C, punishment. So it says that when Muatali, uncle of my majesty, became king, the men of Amaru committed an offense against him, informing him as follows, 
we were voluntary subjects, we are no longer your subjects. And they went over to the king of Egypt. Then my majesty's uncle, uh, then my majesty's uncle Muatali and the king of Egypt fought over the men of Amaru. Muatali defeated them, destroyed the land of Amaru by force of arms and subjugated it. Okay, so pretty straightforward. You know, Muatali says, you know, you've broken your treaty with me. You've gone over to our enemy, Egypt. And so he launches a, a war of retributive justice in response. But vengeance could also be apparently tempered by mercy. And this is a treaty between Moshili II and uh, Manapa Tahunta. And it shows that, that, that Moshili could have been vengeful, but actually chooses to be merciful, even though this particular uh, princeling rebelled against him. Okay, so he says, you've taken the side of Uhaziti, another rebel, um, and I would have destroyed you likewise. So he's already destroyed Uhaziti. But he shows this kind of, this act of contrition. You fell down at my feet. You dispatched old men and old women to me. Your messengers fell down at my feet. You sent to me as follows, spare me, my Lord. May my Lord not destroy me. Then I, my majesty, had compassion for you. And because of that, I acceded to you and made peace with you. So you're seeing here an active kind of political show of mercy, which again is, is, is quite unusual in the ancient Near East. But just to finish with the Hittites before I move on to Israel, there's two things, that I, uh, there's something that I want to discuss, and that's this idea of unjust action. The, and this is really what dis differentiates Hittite thought, the, the, uh, the sense that the Hittites themselves could commit injustices. And this is just two good examples. So we're going back to Mershili II's plague prayers. And he's appealing to the God to basically lift this series of plagues that have been afflicting the kingdom. And essentially he's trying to figure out why the Hittites are suffering so much. And he says he's searched the historical record in the royal archives, and he's kind of identified two sins that might have caused the plague. He says uh, some rituals have been neglected, but more importantly, he thinks that his father, Superluliuma I, broke a treaty oath with Egypt. And you can see that here. And this is actually the, the war with Egypt um, that we previously discussed after the murder of Zenansa. But the problem is, technically, Egypt and Hatti were, had peace treaties at that time. And he says, you know, well, my father went and defeated the Egyptians on the borderland, brought back prisoners of war. But in doing so, he actually broke a treaty of. Um, and, is that, and, the, and, and so that war that he waged against Egypt probably wasn't just. Yeah? It didn't have a real just cause. And he's asking if that's the reason why Hatti has been um, uh, subjected to this plague. There's a second example here of Hattusili III to the king of Achiawa. So the Achiawans are basically the Achaeans, the Mycenaean uh, Greeks. And they're talking about um, a kind of a misplaced hostility over Wilusha. And Wilusha is, of course, Troy, or for, prob almost certainly Troy. And he says, over that matter concerning Wilusha, we were hostile because we have made peace, then what more is there? If one partner confesses his error sin to the other, that's him, that's Hatushili confessing his error, then because he confesses his error sin to that partner, he will not reject him. Because therefore I have confessed my error to sin to my brother, let there be no more hostility between me and my brother. So this is a, a, a Hittite great king saying that the, the wars that we're waging we shouldn't have waged because it's my fault. And he's saying, let's be at peace now. I made an error about who owns this, this territory. You would never find an Egyptian pharaoh make that claim. You would never find an Assyrian great king make that claim. This is really, really unusual for a great king to say, it was my fault, I'm an error, let's move on. Okay, let's be brothers really crucial examples because it recognizes that Hatti, along with the Mashili um, example, recognizes that Hatti is actually capable of waging an unjust war. 
which means that Hittite enemies may possess just cause against Hatti. So this idea of a kind of a bilateral ethics, they can visualize others possessing justice. So this is arguably kind of like truly international system of ethics. Okay, let's go on and talk about Israel because uh, I don't want to run out of time. Now, as I said, while the, the kind of the Hebrew Tanakh provides some evidence for certain injuries against Israel being cited as legitimate Kazabeli, recourse to arguments of justified self-defense, they're actually quite rare in the Tanakh. And that's primarily because the books of the Tanakh more often present Israelites as aggressors and conquerors and victors rather than as victims. On other occasions, though, you know, justice and self-defense is implicit, such as when the Amalekites um, attack the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, that's that. OK. Um, but yeah, on, on the whole, there's, there's, there's not a huge amount. So the Canaanite king of Arad attacked the Israelites in the wilderness and took some of them captive. And as a response, Yahweh helped the Israelites. And it says they delivered up the Canaanites and they and their cities were prescribed. The same against the Amalekites. When the Amalekites attacked the Israelites in the wilderness, Yahweh demands to eventually blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. We have a few potential inconsistencies, though, with the concept of justified self-defense in the Tanakh. There's a very good example with King David. He's received reports. So I should probably not be on this. Might just be confusing. Um, he's received reports that um, the territory of Kyla is under attack. And so he, he asks Yahweh whether or not he should go to Kyla's aid. He he gets an affirmation and subsequently David goes off and um, defeats the Philistines who were or who were attacking Kyla. But the problem is, you know, the text represents the people of Kyla as innocent victims of unjust aggressors. So why did David feel the need to seek an oracle from Yahweh prior to going to Kyla's defense? You know, it's the, it should have been the king's duty to defend his people, to defend his borders. And, and there's clearly an innocent victims here. So, you know, what's going on there? You know, did the author of the book of Samuel assume it was always necessary to have an oracle before you went on any military venture? Can we interpret David's actions as, as prudential concerns about the possibility of success? Or are the ethics of war in ancient Israelite thought kind of based on shifting sands? Are they held hostage, as it were, by the ad hoc whims of Yahweh? It's, it's difficult to tell. In terms of defending territory, then we're on slightly easier ground. Um, it's very prominent, the defense of territory in the Tanakh, because the Israelite concept of war is so closely bound to the story of Israel's territorial manifestation in Canaan. And it's notable that Yahweh's promise of land ownership appears very early in the narrative arc of Israel, even before the name Israel is bestowed on Jacob. So you can see here the slide. This is from Genesis. And I should, I should really emphasize here, just because Genesis is at the beginning of the Tanakh doesn't mean that it's an early book. In fact, a lot of Genesis was written very, very late in terms of the Tanakh's composition. But we're, we're talking about the narrative chronology rather than the actual historical chronology. here. So early on in the narrative, Yahweh makes this gift. He says, to your offspring, I assign this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Incidentally, that would be a massive empire because that would go from the Nile to the Euphrates. Obviously, Israel, even the so-called Solomonic Israel, never uh, encompassed that much territory. Um, but, you know, it's there from very early on that this link between Israelites and territory. We can find a number of kind of pretty uncomplimented, uh, uncomplicated uh, claims to defending stolen or reclaiming stolen land. This is one from Samuel about uh, taking lands back from the Philistines, which they had conquered or taken from Israel. So they're talking about restored that to Israel. Israel recovered all her territory, pretty simple self-defensive territory. 
by far the most interesting case and, and sort of sophisticated case is with Jephthah and Ammon. So um, this, this uh, at, at the outset, we're told that the, the Ammonites went to war against Israel. This is from the book of Judges. And as the newly appointed commander in chief, Jephthah's first act is to send messengers to the king of Ammon. And he asks, what have you against me that you have come to make war on my country? And the king of Ammon replies with a historical claim to significant tracts of land currently dominated by the Israelites. He says, when Israel came from Egypt, so this is the Exodus, they seized the land which is mine from the river Arnon to the river Jabbok as far as the river Jordan. Now then, restore it peaceably. So in response to this historically founded legal challenge, Jephthah adopts his own series of actually very sophisticated historical and legal arguments, utilizing the Exodus account in order to historicize Israel's claims and rebuff those of Ammon. And this, as I said, this is all done through a series of envoys. So to begin, he kind of rebuffs the initial claim made by the Ammonite king that the Israelites had invaded Ammonite territory during the Exodus and explains that his people had never actually entered Ammon or Moab. Um, I'm not going to read this all out to you, but I'll just I'll leave it up there for you to have a look. Essentially, he says that we didn't go into your territory. So having established that the wandering Israelites had not, in fact, violated Ammonite territory during the Exodus, Jephthah then explains that they only came to conquer Amorite land because the Amorites had actually attacked the Israelites first. And this is from the next slide. Okay, so this is when the, the, the Israelites ask for passage across Ammonite ter Amorite territory. The Amorite king Sihon of Heshbon denies them that and then attacks them. Okay. So, so Jephthah rejects the initial Ammonite claim to this land on the basis that prior to the Israelite conquest of Canaan, the territory that, that these two kings are talking about actually belonged to the Amorites, Sihon of Heshbon, not the Ammonites. Sorry, I, I know this is getting a bit confusing, but it's, it's really important. Jephthah also identifies the grievances, the, the denial of passage and the unprovoked aggression from the Amorites as just causes for the Israelites waging war against them. This victory against the Amorites is made possible by divine favor from Yahweh and his intervention. And therefore, he says that the Israelite possession of Amorite land is legitimate, not only as a justified response against uh, armed aggression, but also because Yahweh showed them favor and gave it to them. And Jephthah then continues after this, his, his legal rebuttal of Ammon's claims by challenging his rival to explain why, if Ammon truly had claim to these Amorite lands, why they hadn't taken any action for 300 years. Yeah, that this, that these events were happened 300 years ago, so why hasn't Ammon claimed them within the last 300 years? So this kind of fascinating and really quite lengthy exchange highlights a number of important issues. The original grievances that led to the Israelite conquest of Amorite territory, the divine sanction of Israelite military action, um, the importance of time in establishing ownership, and the legitimacy of military responses. However, it also has to be said that at the end of this episode, Jephthah is still compelled to seek Yahweh's help in order to secure victory against the Ammonites, which eventually leads him to having to sacrifice his own daughter, his only child. And so you're kind of left with this impression, well, if the legal facts were so compelling, why did Jephthah feel also compelled to act to kind of make this foolhardy vow to Yahweh in order to get additional divine help? Why not trust in the ethics? Why not trust in the law, as it were? And so we come to an argument, I think, that the relative ethical and legal status of Israel's claims as regards to disputed territory really appear to be of secondary importance. It's about the relationship of Yahweh 
with Yahweh rather, and I'll come back to that. In terms of the defense of allies, this is almost entirely absent from causes for Israelite warfare. We have vague references to Solomon allying with Egypt through diplomatic marriages, but nothing about his military aid in any way. There are a couple of occasions where Samaria and Judah um, embark on campaigns as allies um, together against Aram and Elam and Moab. Um, but they tend to be offensive campaigns rather than defensive in nature. So they're not really defending allies strictly. Um, and the paucity of references to defensive alliances within the Tanakh, I think is really best explained by the fact that the Israelites are a chosen people of Yahweh. So Israel's exalted status and its covenant with its God didn't really encourage alliances with non-Yahweh worshipping peoples. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, the Israelites are either invulnerable because they have the support of Yahweh or they're doomed because they breached the covenant and Yahweh wants to punish them. So neither position really requires political allies. Now, I would stress this is not necessary because Judah and Samaria did not have allies. This is because the authors and redactors of the Tanakh wanted to stress a theological message over kind of a historical reality as it were. But vengeance is very important in Israelite thought. Perhaps the best case is vengeance against Amalek, who I've already mentioned. So Amalek attacks the Israelite column during their period of wandering. And decades later, Moses kind of reminds his people, instructs his people that they have to get vengeance, that they have to completely, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, they have to completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget, it says in Deuteronomy. And this, this passage in Deuteronomy is really kind of setting up for a, a later uh, a passage in, in 1 Samuel, a kind of a preparatory justification for the eventual destruction of Amalek by King Saul. And again, this is the, the reminder in that passage. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I am exacting the penalty for what Amalek did to Israel for the assault he made upon them on the road on their way up from Egypt. Now go, attack Amalek and prescribe all that belongs to him. Spare no one, but kill alike men and women, infants and sucklings, oxen and sheep, camels and asses. So this is, her this is called harem warfare. Absolutely no limits whatsoever. Everything has to be prescribed, all living things. Now, of course, in this example, Time doesn't seem to be a factor. You know, by the time the Saul comes to destroy Amalek, we're talking about several generations. Um, so, you know, referring back to Jephthah's kind of jibe at Ammon that, well, why haven't you acted sooner? You know, Saul is acting many generations later himself, but that isn't highlighted by the, the Israelite text. But this is clearly an act of retributive justice. And of course, it's in no way proportionate. You know, we have essentially a raiding attack on the column versus a genocidal destruction of Amalek. But um, this, is, this, is, this is an example of the seriousness with which vengeance was treated. This could also apply within Israel itself, um, within the Israelite community, particularly wars uh, against those who uh, rebelled against the covenant. And this is a type of vengeance warfare in punishment for rebellion. So because the Israel, Israel is conceived as a religious community, um, in Deuteronomic law, you have this, um, this prescription of those who find themselves rebelling against Yahweh, who, who worship other gods. And it's the duty of the whole Israelite community to wage this harem, this unlimited warfare against those criminals. Finally, I just want to briefly consider a couple of significant instances of Israelite violence that are prosecuted without any obvious just cause at all or pre-existing injury. I guess the most obvious example of this is the conquest of Canaan itself, which is prosecuted not on account of any specific injury done by the Canaanites against the Israelites as a people, but rather on the basis that Yahweh has deemed these nations unfit to inhabit the land and thus gifted that land to the Israelites. So arguably there is a form of just cause there, but it's an incredibly broadly conceived one. It's offenses against the universal sovereignty of Yahweh. 
It's not in any way a political injury or grievance against the Israelites as a people. Perhaps though the most egregious example of, of a specific unprovoked war is committed by the Danite tribe. Um, Judges recalls how the tribe of Dan was seeking a territory in which to settle. Um, so they dispatched spies into the land. The spies discover the town of Laish, also referred to as Leshem, where it says they observed the people in it dwelling carefree after the manner of the Sidonians, a tranquil and unsuspecting people with no one in the land to molest them and with no hereditary ruler. So the spies immediately go back and are like, right guys, we've got to go kill these guys and take their land because they're not going to suspect us. The elders of the tribe say, brilliant, that sounds fantastic. And so they immediately arm themselves and march off to Laish. And you can see here in the slightly later passages, so the Danites proceeded to Laish, a people tranquil and unsuspecting, and they put them to the sword and burned down the town. They rebuilt the town and settled there, and they named the town Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was Israel's son. And the Danites are actually often like portrayed as slightly thuggish in the Tanakh, but really there's no other, con there's no real con condemnation of this text, the, uh, of this passage. You know, the, the, the author or the editor leaves it as, as really neutral, um, but clearly, you know, there's absolutely no just cause at all here. They, they just, it's a simply is a land grab. And there's various other examples I could discuss, you know, the Benjamite, Benjaminites um, launch an unprovoked attack against Shiloh in order to acquire female concubines, a bit like the kind of the rape of the Sabine women in Roman history. Um, David launches brutal raids for plunder against um, the Geshurites, the Gizrites, uh, and the Amalekites as well. Several kings of Samaria and Judah are guilty of, of similar actions. And so there's really quite a few examples. Okay, so let's bring it all together in terms of conclusion. So I could keep on providing numerous examples from both Hattie and Israel, um, but obviously I don't have time to do that. But I think it's important to just to highlight that attitudes to just cause in the Tanakh are always colored by Israel's relationship with Yahweh. You know, the first principle is that Yahweh has bestowed ownership of the land of Canaan on the Israelites. However, you know, Israelites tempe Israel's tempestuous relationship required a kind of a penitential journey towards salvation that sometimes required defeat and sometimes required victory, sometimes defensive, sometimes offensive violence, sometimes restraint, sometimes massacre. And actually, if we're thinking that most of the Tanakh was put together in the post-exilic period, you know, writing after the collapse of Samaria, after the collapse of Judah, you know, the terrible demands of Yahweh's salvific plan would have appeared very real and immediate to these authors. But this, this facet of Israelite thought, the fact that it's actually the relationship with Yahweh that determines just cause, really undermines, I guess, a casuistic understanding of Yustakauza in Israelite war ethics. So according to the authors of the Tanakh, Israel was always the center of Yahweh's concerns, whether for good or for ill. And they interpret the defeat of Israel in war as a punishment for Israelite sins, not an affirmation of the justice of the enemy victor. So in other words, Israelite success or failure in war was, wasn't determined by any sense of just cause in, in, in our kind of our, our modern sense. It was determined by the nature of its relationship with Yahweh at that time. So the outcome of an Israelite war was not a commentary on Israel's claim to justice or injustice against a specific people or its ethical or legal relationship with its international peers, but rather it's a witness of its ongoing relationship with its God. And, and if it was in favor with its God, in other words, if it was acting in accord with the covenant and piously, then they would be victorious. If it was acting impiously and breaking the covenant, then they would be defeated. It was almost, you know, the, the claims of the enemy were essentially irrelevant. So, you know, a very kind of highly mutable <laughs> um, idea of just cause in a way, almost, yeah, difficult to call it an ethical legal category. So this, this, the Israelite tradition with its emphasis on the relationship between the people and their national God in determining questions of justice in war was actually very similar to other Near Eastern traditions of just war thought, most notably Egypt and Assyria. And I've argued elsewhere that, that Egypt possessed quite a highly developed ethics of war, but they're very partisan. 
So, you know, while generations of biblical scholars have emphasized how different Israelite culture was to its neighbors and contemporaries, I think in this regard, it's actually remarkably similar. We could think of it as standard. Um, and actually, uh, uh, there's a good book by Carly Crouch, who has made similar argument about Israel there. And so the real outlier in this ancient Near Eastern context is actually the Hittite tradition. So whilst Hattie does follow many of the prevalent norms of the region, the Hittite tradition also showed itself capable of taking a more objective and legalistic attitude to the question of justice in war and just cause. The Hittites realized that they themselves could commit injustices and that their enemies might have a just cause against Hattie. The Hittites understood war as a, understood war as a legal process a proper legal process, and, and really the just would triumph. And I think this willingness to admit that justice could exist beyond the Hittite state and beyond the Hittite people was genuinely unique. And I think it's the beginning of what we would recognize as a quote unquote proper ethics of war in a modern sense, in terms of uh, uh, bilateral and reciprocal ethics. So in many ways, I think the Hittites could be thought of as the Ur culture of the modern just war tradition. And uh, I'll leave it there. I'm sorry for overrunning by a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cox. No, that was perfect also for the timing and it was very interesting. Uh, we have many topics uh, that are fascinating and that we tackled. And um, as I said before, Time questions uh, will be at the uh, end of both the seminaries, so I'll leave the floor to um, Professor Yusuf. Thank you, Rory, for a fascinating talk. Looking forward for your uh, book. It's uh, delightful to be here, but devo dire un'altra volta che la spero che la prossima volta ci vediamo a Bologna. Uh, it might be um, useful for attendance uh, uh, while I give my speech to download um, the handouts uh, which contains all the sources that I will discuss today and uh, it is um, to be found in, in chat, right? So it might be useful uh, to download and um, have it while I give my, my, my paper. So you can hear me all right? The author of the, of the Traditio Apostolica, who might have been Hippolytus, advised Christians not to seek a military career. He also provided for those who had started a military career prior to their conversion to Christianity. If they were ordinary soldiers, they should refuse the order to kill take the military oath and sign the position of superior officers or magisters who inflict or carry out the death penalty. If they were superior officers and magisters, then they were expected to change careers. The author of the Traditio Apostolica made clear distinctions and put different limitations on what a Christian could or should do according to his position in the army and the time of his conversion. There was no universal rejection of the notion of military duty as such. A military career was seen as a possibility, but the limitations put on it not to kill and not to take the military oath made it virtually impossible for someone to continue to serve without attracting the attention and the fury of their superiors. The Traditio Apostolica is the earliest surviving collection of church regulations for the appropriate Christian conduct of laity and clergy composed at the end of the second or the beginning of the third century and one of the earliest evidence for the existence of anti-military sentiments in the Christian church. We do not know whether these regulations were ever followed or even accepted and authorized as generally binding by the Christian congregation in which their author belonged. He would certainly have wished the latter to be the case. In 314 uh, CE, the Synod of Arles, summoned at Emperor Constantine's bequest, promulgated in Canon 3 that those who throw away their arms in times of peace should be kept from communion. 
this canon has greatly vexed me, has greatly vexed scholars interested in early Christian attitudes to warfare. Several interpretations have been proposed to the phrases arma projicunt and in pace. Some scholars replace the arma projicunt with arma conjicunt, assuming that the canon prohibited Christians from carrying weapons in peacetime and referred either to gladiatorial games or the carrying of weapons in everyday life. Other scholars asserted that the early church was pacifist and understood either that Christians were only allowed to pursue military careers as long as they didn't shed blood, but were only engaged in police work, and if they abandoned their police duties, then they were in trouble. Similarly, others understood that Christians helped the Roman army only in periods when there were no wars and kept themselves on part when they were. For the church expected its members not to get involved in warfare, but punish them if they refused to help the state when there were no wars. A few scholars understood the term peace in quite a different way, as the peace that prevailed between the empire and the church with the termination of persecutions against Christians. Finally, some replaced the in pace with in bello, discerning a Christian effort to please the state by prohibiting Christians from feeling an aversion to warfare and subsequently being uncomfortable in the army. We can maintain that the church was not pacifist, but tried to please the state without having to replace any words, if we assume that the church prohibited its members from finding the military profession incompatible with their faith, even in periods when there was no warfare and no bloodshed, and punished all those who dared to desert their posts. And the Council of Arles made no mention of throwing away arms in times of war, to which the church also objected, because military laws had already covered this possibility and had assigned the death penalty. Admittedly, none of these interpretations is entirely convincing. However, some are less convincing than others. First of all, it seems unlikely that the distinction between police work and military work was a meaningful one in the Roman world. There was physical violence involved in both activities, and the church could not have expected its members to serve, to serve only in periods of relative calm and desert when war was threatened. No army would have tolerated such an arrangement and no emperor. And we know that the emperor was present at the proceedings. It was explicitly stated so in the published text. Furthermore, the military laws had already covered the possibility and had assigned penalties for desertion, not only times of war, but also of peace. This leaves us with the following possibilities, either to take in pace to mean the end of Christian persecution or to replace words arma projicum with arma conjicum or in pace with in bello. We have no reason to believe that the author of the canon did not have the end of persecutions in mind. However, there is no strong evidence to support such an interpretation either, and there is no evidence to justify the replacement of any words. Canon 3 is far too brief. The rest of the canons of the Council were concerned about donatism, celibacy, the consecration of bishops, rebaptism, and various other issues that unfortunately do not clarify the obscurity of the meaning of Canon 3. It is only helpful to keep in mind that since the Emperor Constantine was present at the Council meetings, it is highly unlikely that the Council would have decided something that might displease him and jeopardize his loyalty to the church. Condemning Christian participation in warfare would certainly not be to any emperor's liking. Thus, it seems reasonable to assume that service in the army could create problems for the early Christian conscience, and that was the reason a relevant canon was included in the council. But the church's decision was in favor of Christian participation in warfare. This canon could be a Christian response to the generosity of Constantine, who had, a few years earlier, obliged the church by commanding the following. 
and I will read Eusebius Vita Constantini 2.33. Once more, with respect to those who had previously been preferred to any military distinction of which they were afterwards deprived for the cruel and unjust reason that they chose rather to acknowledge their alliance to God than to retain the rank they held. We leave them perfectly liberty of choice, either to occupy their former stations, should they be content again to engage the military service, or after an honorable discharge to live in undisturbed tranquility. For it is fair and reasonable that men who have displayed such magnanimity and fortitude in meeting the perils to which they have been exposed should be allowed the choice either of enjoying peaceful leisure or resuming their former rank. Constantine, with this rescript preserved by Eusebius in uh, the Emperor's biography, the Vita Constantini, permitted soldiers who had deserted, were demoted or expelled from their posts on account of their faith to have the option of resuming their former ranks in the army or to obtain honorable discharge. Modern scholarship has correctly understood the emperor as referring to the desertion of Christians from the Roman army under the anti-Christian measures of the emperors Diocletian and Licinius or Diocletian and Galerius. Their script started and concluded with Constantine expressing his conviction that he enjoyed the unlimited favor of the Christian God he honored. It announced measures manifesting the emperor's support to the church, the return of Christian exiles to their homes, the release of the clergy from curial duties, the restoration of Christian property, the release of Christians from confinement, prison and hard labor, the restoration of Christian soldiers to military rank, the release of Christians from service in state factories and the restoration of their noble status were applicable. The document was sent to all eastern provinces. The church and the state had begun a dialogue, a dialogue in good faith to define the terms of their relationships. It would be interesting to follow the dialogue as much as we can by examining canons, decrees and laws. The state needed men to serve as soldiers. In 318, a law was published that obliged the sons of veterans to serve in the army. The state did not want the church to avert its members from pursuing military careers. In 325, the Council of Nicaea, which was summoned by Constantine when he discovered that theological disputes had broken out in the East concerning the nature of Jesus and his relationship with his father, provided, provided the following in Canon 12. Those who responded to the call of grace and initially expressed their faith by putting off the military belt, but who subsequently acted like dogs returning to their vomit when they offered money and gifts to get back to the army, must remain among the hearers for three years and then among the supplicants for ten more. In all such cases, however, it is proper to examine into the purpose and nature of their repentance. For as many as manifest their conversion indeed, and not in appearance only, by their fear and tears and patience and good works, this having completed the prescribed time as hearers, may properly commu co communicate in the prayers and the bishop may be allowed to determine yet more favorably respecting them. But those who hear their sentence with indifference and think the form of entering into the church sufficient for their conversion must not complete the whole time. Did the Christians in Nicaea have a different position from the Christians in Arles? Was Canon 12 of the Council of Nicaea an expression of the incompatibility of Christian faith with the military profession and a declaration towards the state of its decision not to help the state by supplying Christians to serve? This possibility is highly unlikely, since Emperor Constantine presided at the proceedings and gave the canons of the Council the force of imperial laws. And anyway, the Church would not have insulted her most precious ally, the Emperor, in such an obvious and careless way. Perhaps the Church and the Emperor imagined that it would be possible to have a completely pagan army with no Christians serving in the ranks. 
there is no evidence to support such a hypothesis. The vast majority of serious scholars rightly believe that the canon does not concern the military profession in general and its relationship to the Christian faith. It concerns rather only those Christian soldiers who under the Emperor Licinius preferred to resign their posts instead of succumbing to the Emperor's pressures to take part in pagan sacrifice. However, they subsequently returned to their ranks out of love for or in need of money and paid the require, required homage to the traditional gods. Whether the canon referred only to a particular case or had more general character, what we ought to keep in mind it's, is that for some early fourth century Christians, returning to the army once it had been abandoned was inconceivable. The author of the canons 13 and 14 of the Church of Alexandria, dated between 336 to 340, probably did not have a specific case in mind when they declared the following. A man who has accepted the authority to kill, even if he is a soldier, he should on no account do it. And those who are soldiers and are ordered to fight should also refrain from slandering and neither put on crowns on their heads nor obtain any military standard. Every man who has been elevated with the ornament of justice to the position of perfect or excellence or authority, which is in accordance with the gospel and does not comply, he is to be separated from the congregation and a bishop should not pray in his presence. A Christian should not voluntarily become a soldier unless compelled to by someone in authority. He should have a sword, but he should not be commanded to shed blood. If it is ascertained that he has done so, he should stay away from the sacraments at least until he has been purified through tears and lamentation. He should fulfill his obligations without deceit and in fear of God. Christians ought preferably to stay away from the army in order to avoid shedding blood. However, if someone in authority compelled them to join, then they would have little choice but to accept. Not upsetting the authorities was always a top priority for the church. The canons of the Church of Alexandria, also known as Canones Hippolyti, were based on the Traditio Apostolica. Both works were considered pseudepigraphic and wrongly ascribed to Hippolytus. The author of the Canons of Alexandria was not as strict as the author of the Traditio Apostolica. He was willing to pardon Christian involvement in the military if under pressure from the authorities. Finally, it needs to be mentioned that the canons in all probability had only local force. There's all, no evidence whatsoever to suggest that they were considered binding by other communities outside Alexandria. For some Christians, it was crucial to differentiate whose blood one said, or was called to said, if the killing was instigated from private initiative and for private gain, then it was unacceptable. But if one was instructed by the authorities to do so on the battlefield or in order to defend an ideal and to protect the nation's interests, then it was a completely different matter. In that case, killing might even be praiseworthy, as Athanasius, one of the most important uh, Christian theologians of the fourth century, stated. One is not supposed to kill, but killing the enemy in battle is both lawful and praiseworthy. For these reasons, individuals who have distinguished themselves in war um, are considered worthy of great honors and monuments are erected to celebrate their accomplishments. Thus, at one particular time and under one set of circumstances, an act is not permitted, but when the time and conditions are right, it is both allowed and condoned. Basil was another prominent Christian theologian, theologian who was aware of this simplistic distinction between private and, that, and thus objectionable, objectionable murder and public and thus praiseworthy killing, but felt a little uncomfortable with it in 374, approximately 20 years after Athanasius uh, wrote uh, the quote um, I have just read. According to Basil, our predecessors did not consider killing in war as murder, but, as I understand it, made allowances for those who fought on the side of moderation and piety. Nonetheless, it is good to admonish those 
whose hands are unclean to abstain just for, from communion for three years. Soldiers who shed blood were to be simply excluded from the sacrament of the communion for three years. We do not know whether Basil was conveying an expression of opinion or an express injection. However, it is interesting that he was not annoyed as much as to order something drastic like the excommunication of soldiers who said blood. Basil did not detest soldiers. Let us keep in mind that he had addressed his Epistula 106 to a soldier who had, he admitted, perfect love for God. Athanasius and Basil had slightly different views. For Athanasius, service in the army was completely unproblematic. For Basil, there was a problem, but it could be easily overcome. The council in Trullo in 691 did not discern any difference of opinion between the two passages from Athanasius and Basil and gave to both of them precepts the status of a canon. It seems that by the end of the fourth century, Christians were beginning to reach a consensus as far as the issue of setting blood in warfare was concerned. The principle eventually applied only to the Christian clergy. Constituones Apostolorum, a voluminous compilation of earlier church orders created in Syria between 375 and uh, 400, ended with the Canones Apostolorum that consists in part of synodal canons from different sources that had perhaps been collected in an earlier Corpus Canonum. Most of the canons dealt with the ordination, the official responsibilities, and the moral conduct of the clergy, and only a few were concerned with the duties of Christians in general. Canon 83 required that any bishop, priest, or deacon devoting himself to military service and aiming at combining it with the duties of his office shall be forthwith degraded from his ecclesiastical rank on the principle of failing to give to Caesar what is his and to God what is God's. The clergy was allowed, if necessary, to get involved in a battle, but not to kill a human being. The clergy was preferably to avoid violence violence under all circumstances. As far as the lady was concerned, they were not prevented from entering the army. And those already in the army prior to their conversion were simply encouraged to obey the injunctions given to soldiers by John the Baptist, to be unfair to no man, to accuse no man falsely, and to be content with their hire. If Christian soldiers gave that promise, they were to be admitted to the Christian community, and if they refused to do so, they were to be rejected. There was no real obstacle for a soldier to become a Christian or a Christian to become a soldier unless he had a clerical office. Eusebius was probably the first theologian to draw an elaborate comparison between the avocations permissible to the clergy and to the laymen, and specified as among those that belong solely to the latter, the carrying of just warfare. From the end of the fourth century onwards, more and more Christian councils under the influence of industrious theologians started discouraging much more strongly the clergy from getting involved in warfare. The eighth canon of the Council of Toledo in 398 forbade anyone who after baptism has put on the military belt to be raised to the office of a deacon. The seventh canon of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 anathematized all whom, having been once enrolled among the clergy or were monks, to return either to warfare or to secular employment. Canon 5 of the first canon of Tours in 460 excommunicated all clergy who engaged in warfare. The first canon of the Council of Relida Reli in 523, speaking of the case of clergy who might be in a besieged city, provided that all who minister at the altar should abstain from shedding human blood. Those who had done so, even in the case of an enemy, should be removed for 10 years, not only from their office, but from communion.
The two years were to be spent in fasting, prayers, and almsgiving. At the end of the two years, they might be restored, but never promoted to higher stations. The penance might be pro protracted at the will of the bishop, if not performed to his satisfaction. Canon 5 of the First Council of Macon in 581 provided that any clergy wearing arms should be kept for 30 days on bread and water. Canon 19 of the Fourth Council of Toledo in 633 forbade that any employed in secular warfare or pursuit should be ordained while Canon 44 directed that those of the clergy who ventured to take up arms shall be similarly treated and sent to do penance in a monastery. The fact that numerous ecclesiastical, I, I can go on, but I will spare you more details. The fact that numerous ecclesiastical canons systematically condemned any involvement of the Christian clergy in military affairs requires explanation. Was it a custom devoid of meaning? Were the Christian councils simply repeating earlier injections? Or did the clergy tend to forget that war was not their business and the councils had to remind them? There is ample evidence that the latter was true. It seems that the clergy often preferred the excitement of the camp to the seclusion of the cloisters or the monotony of their clerical duties. The canons were frequently transgressed, especially during the medieval times, um, Rory knows uh, uh, best. The state found the decision of the church to keep only its religious officials away from warfare and politics convenient. Emperors endorsed the idea that the clergy and the monks ought to avoid violence, keep themselves apart from political affairs and to be ex exempt from public duties. However, emperors were willing in collaboration with the church authorities to allow exceptions. In 380 and 98, according to the Codex Theodosianus 16.2.31, if someone who held a clerical office got involved in violence, they might consider forgiving him. The accepted norm was that the clergy would not mingle in military affairs or indeed any kind of violence. Of course, Christians were not to take advantage of this agreement and no one was to hold an ecclesiastical office in order to excuse himself from service in the army or fulfilling his civic duties. At the same time, the state expected only Christians to serve in the army. In 416, Theodosius II issued a decree stipulating that only Christians were allowed to serve in the army. And in 519 or 520, it was only Orthodox Christians and not heretics uh, they were permitted to enlist. To conclude, Christian involvement in military affairs started creating problems for the Christian conscience from the beginning of the fourth century. It was rarely generally forbidden. Normally, several factors and conditions had to be taken into account before a decision was reached. It was examined whether a Christian had to kill or had already killed a human being, had to give or was given the order to kill on the battlefield, took the initiative to kill for his own reasons and profit, whether he had to take or taken the pagan military oath, whether he was a soldier or a high-ranking official, whether he uh, was in the army prior, during or after his conversion to Christianity, whether he had left the army and later returned to his post, and most importantly, perhaps, whether he was a cleric, a monk or an ordinary Christian. Christian involvement in military affairs was a complicated issue that could afford no easy solutions. The issue of the permissibility of enlistment and participation in warfare is part of the relations between church and state. The early Christians' divergence in perspective was connected to their understanding of political responsibility and their view of the authorities. Christian attitudes to war violence and the military service were and still are shaped by attitudes to the political authorities. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yusif. Um, this was as well a very interesting presentation. I think we uh, might have some questions. Um, maybe they are coming from Facebook or... Uh, uh, I'm afraid I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Alessia, I cannot hear you. This uh, a problem. Can you hear me now? Can anybody hear me? Yeah. You descend, Alessia. Okay. Uh, Professor, yeah. do you hear me now? I think she doesn't. Um, I think she doesn't, and I don't know how to fix this, actually. Um, so um, we will wait and see if we can fix this problem. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Mm, otherwise, I know. Sorry. Um, uh, otherwise, we maybe can start with some questions for Dr. Cox and see if we can solve this problem. Can you hear me now, Professor Yusuf? Still not. Um, I know I'm sorry. Um, uh, just, a, just a moment. Here is a, okay, uh, maybe we'll start with... Mm, maybe. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Yusuf had to leave the um, room. Uh, maybe we can wait just a few seconds more to see if the um, problem is solved when she comes back. And, um, and we can start with some questions uh, for Dr. Cox. I don't know if, they, um, if we have some questions coming from Facebook, maybe someone can tell me this. Um, otherwise, I have some questions. So um, maybe I can start with mine and then um, we can uh, wait for the other. Okay, let's see. Professor Yusuf, can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear me? It's fine. No, I I can. I don't know if I can leave the room and then enter back because uh, I'm like a co-host or something, and I don't know if my um, if I'm if I go out, then the um, stream would fail. But um, Professor Yusuf, uh, uh, I can hear you now. Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, I'm so glad. <laughs> I was already sweating. <laughs> Me too. It, it might look like a trick, but I don't want to receive questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, yeah, it, it, this was just a little um, uh, like overwhelming for me. You know, for a moment, I felt really overwhelmed. But yeah, uh, I was saying maybe we can start with some questions for Dr. Cox um, and then uh, move on to the um, to your questions so that we still follow that um, order that we have given at the beginning. OK, it's fine. I'm happy you can hear me now. OK, so um, Dr. Cox. Um, um let me see um how important was according to you the um merging of religion and state governing in the hittite society and did it influence the uh, definition of just war and um finally can we relate these topics to the broader concept of authority in the sense of defining a just war, the authority of the uh, religious field and the authority of the political field, how they interact? Yeah, thanks, um, Alessia. Yeah, uh, yeah, really good questions. Um, when we're talking about the ancient Near East, now this is really true of the ancient world in, in general, but, but the ancient Near East certainly, you, you can't really separate religion and state. 
Um, they go hand in hand. And, you know, political thought is as much cosmological and theological thought as it is anything else. And so, yeah, while I, I didn't you know, have enough time to talk about authority, notions of authority are absolutely intrinsic to how states thought about war in this, in this period. Now, unlike say in Egypt, where pharaohs claim to be sons of Horus and sons of Amun, and th there's a bit of a debate as to the degree to which pharaohs actually claim divinity, but they, they claim kind of semi-divinity um, in Hatti, that never really happens until perhaps right at the end of the empire, there's a little bit of evidence that Hittite kings, probably under the pressure from their, 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 their Egyptian counterparts, start perhaps claiming a type of semi-divinity. In other words, you know, what the Egyptians are doing is so we, we should as well. Um, but, from, but there's not actually very good evidence for that. And the, so the Hittite kings, like I said, uh, are very much seen as caretakers. They're kind of, they are, they are appointed by the gods um, and their first duty is to the gods. They're also the kind of, they're also the sort of the first priest of the kingdom. So we have a, a lot of evidence of Hittite religious ritual and the kings play a fundamental um, role in that ritual. And interestingly as well, the female, the, usually the queen mother, um, so the mother of the, the current king, um, also held a very senior religious post in the kingdom and was responsible for a lot of religious ritual. And that actually led into a, a number of kind of um, problems in court and there's lots of kind of assassinations and usurpations and basically queen mothers uh, intriguing to have their sons placed on, on the throne because Hittite kings often took more than one wife. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, the king is, is there to lead religious ritual and he is, the, he is the, the point of contact between the people and the gods. And that is, and, and so in, in, when it comes to war, he is responsible for um, appealing to the gods for their support, for you know, and a lot of the prayers and, and the other documents we have, essentially they kind of lay their case out in front of the gods. They say, you know, this is what has happened. This is why it's, it's an injury to us. And essentially this is why you should support us. Please give us your aid. And then they go to war. Um, and there, there would have been a, a series of oracles and, and, and other rituals as well prior to combat. So yeah, the, the, the importance of religion and, and, and state authority is, is, is absolutely front and center. The, the, but the difference, I think, like I said, with, with Hattie is that while the king is, is seen as responsible for that relationship, there's, there's a lot of evidence that the, that the kings talk about their own sin. Um, and they, they are kind of very humble before the gods rather than just talking about how great they are. And, you know, I could show you a number of other examples where essentially the king, almost like a kind of a Christian um, prayer, you know, from the Middle Ages, you know, kings will say how sinful they are, how they've been impious and how they beg forgiveness and have done X, Y and Z to, um, to remedy this impiety or this sin and then that's why the gods should support them. There's also a sense of, um, in, in Hittite law, the sin of the father, so this, you know, this, this makes you think of, say, the, 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 the story of Adam and the first sin of mankind. In Hittite law, the sin of the father passed on to the son. So the son could be punished, even executed, for the sin of the father. So that's why in a lot of those sources that I showed you, the kings are talking about what their fathers have done or what their predecessors have done, because in terms of their cosmology, they as king or as successor are just as responsible for that act as the person who actually committed it. So, of course, that kind of makes makes the, the, the justice in war a lot more complicated. But yeah, I mean, religion is, is absolutely intrinsic to how they see their world and how they see themselves within it.
Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Very precise and very also um, uh, illuminating on the topic. And um, kind of a similar question can be um, related also to the Israelites um, in relation, for example, to the episode of King David. Uh, here again, the uh, concept of authority uh, is uh, a, important no? for the uh, definition also of the, um, the intervention, the motive that led to this um, intervention. And if you want to add something uh, more uh, to what you already have said about this episode, is there something that you didn't mention and that was uh, important regarding this? So which episode particularly involving David? Uh, the 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 um oh, the one with Tyler. yes exactly the in the taking of that um region of that portion of territory yeah okay so yeah so the so the the Kyla, we don't have too much more all, all that the text says is that the philistines were attacking david's um territory attacking the the inhabitants of Kyla and plundering them and they were basically begging for intervention and so david you know seems to have a duty to respond to that. I mean, it's a very clear example of self-defensive warfare. And yet he doesn't do it. You know, he, first of all, he takes an oracle and basically asks Yahweh, should I do this or shouldn't I? Um, and Yahweh says, yes, you should. And he goes off and does it. And Yahweh gives his support and he defeats the Philistines and retakes the property and, and, and it's all well and good. But it's, it's very odd that he should even feel the, the, the necessity to take that oracle. And again, it comes back to this idea that Every, every Israelite act of war is dependent upon your, their, their success is dependent upon Yahweh's support. And Yahweh's support cannot be guaranteed. You know, Israelite rulers, according to the authors of the Tanakh, and we always have to kind of keep going and putting in that caveat that this is, you know, this is a, this is a, a, this is a religious story with a lot of didactic importance rather than a history. Um, you know, Israelite or rulers can never take for granted that they're acting in you know with Yahweh's approval um but I mean David though is an interesting example because he's actually uh, arguably an usurper himself so so Saul you know was the first king of Israel and he becomes jealous of David after David slays Goliath and feels that David has undermined his authority and wants to take his kingship David kind of claims to be innocent of this but interestingly the 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 prophet uh, uh samuel kind of anoints david as as the the ruler of israel as the new king of israel and the reason for this is because saul has lost yahweh's favor because he doesn't fulfill the prescription of the amalekites so we i showed you some sex about how the amalekites had to be kind of like genocidally slaughtered and saul doesn't kill their kings he takes them captive rather than killing them and he also allows his troops to take plunder rather than burning it all and it's actually that show of restraint that loses him Yahweh's support and that is when Yahweh and Samuel distance themselves from Saul and when the kind of authority the new authority is bestowed upon David um, and Saul eventually dies in battle, not against David, against the Philistines. But um, so there's an interesting, you know, point of, of, of there that it's actually Saul's act of restraint in war that loses him Yahweh's support, that, that he wasn't kind of brutal enough in, in this kind of very um, yeah, unrestrained form of harem warfare. Um, traditionally, Israelite warfare is kind of divided between uh, what's called obligatory war an optional war um but that's a rabbinical division that that comes from um the talmud and the mishnah so that's actually a, a rabbinical category from really the first to the seventh century ce that has really been followed by the people but there's no reason actually why that by bipartite category should be used by us you know the the, the rabbis of the sixth century CE were, were no really better off in their knowledge of, of Israelite warfare in the fifth century BCE than, than we are, arguably less so. So actually, I think, you know, looking at warfare in the Israelite sources through the lens of, of the modern just war tradition is actually quite revealing um, and, and, and 
good for comparison. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would have a lot of questions, but uh, um, just another one, and then we can move to Dr. Yusuf. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that the Hittite law, um, Hittite case law, uh, influenced heavily the Code of the Covenant and the uh, Deuteronomic Code. Um, it, which are the elements in common? Can you um, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So, so the, the easiest examples to give are actually the, the relationship with Yahweh itself. So effectively, if you read the covenant um, in, in things like Exodus, the relationships that is created between Yahweh and the Israelites, the, the form of the language, um, the, 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 even the kind of the syntax in some senses, um, are almost identical to the Hittite treaty forms. So in other words, where the, the Yahweh is the substitute for the Hittite great king and the Israelites are the substitute for the vassal states. So if you go and read Hittite treaties, and this also applies to Assyrian treaties, which come afterwards, you know, you have the great king. He makes a series of stipulations about what the vassal state has to do and then makes a series of reciprocal obligations as a protector of the vassal state. And basically what the, the covenant tradition in, in, in Deuteronomy and, and, and Exodus has done is essentially take that treaty form and yeah, and just insert the name of Yahweh and insert the name Israelites. And it's, and it's I mean, you know, there are ex there's extensive scholarship on this. So this thing, don't just take my word for it. And, and, you know, people who have looked at this incredibly carefully, and it's really very obvious um, that, that that's what has happened in terms of the Decalogue itself. Um, I mean, obviously, there's only, you know, 10 laws in the Decalogue. There are longer laws that are in uh, Leviticus and, and, and Numbers, I think. Um, again, it's things like relationship between parents, um, punishment of criminals, um, all very, very similar. And in some and in some cases, almost taken verbatim from the Hittite law. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, Hattie collapses in 1200, you know, at, if the United Kingdom of Israel existed, it probably wasn't founded until maybe 10 hundred, 1050 at, at the very earliest. So we have a kind of 100, 150 year gap at, at best, you know, that's assuming that the Solomonic Kingdom existed or, the, or Saul's Kingdom existed. So how does that transmission take place? Well, it takes place because you, you start after Hattie Falls, you have the creation of what called the Neo-Hittite Kingdoms. And essentially, like I mentioned in the beginning, that the Hittite Empire kind of ran as a sort of federal system almost. So these regional cities actually had quite a lot of autonomy, places like Carchemish, uh, Ugarit, uh, um, and, and others. And essentially, they preserved in, in, in all but name Hittite forms of government on a smaller scale. And they were using these sorts of vassal treaties themselves, even after the Hittite Empire fell. And of course, it's these cities, including the Phoenician cities like Tyre, Sidon, Byblos, um, that again would have preserved these treaty forms, would have preserved these kind of legal forms. And that is probably how the Israelites of Samaria and Judah keyed into this older tradition, as, as well as through the Assyrian, the Neo Assyrians, who become powerful in around 900 as well. Thank you. Thank you again very much. Um, we will see if we will have any other question for you, Dr. Cox. Um, by now, I will move to uh, Professor Yusif. Um, and uh, um, I wanted to ask you, Professor Yusif, um, as, um, as we have seen, um, we have talked much about the uh, various um, Christian councils and canons, but just like to broader, broaden up a little bit the discourse, um, we have seen that in Christian and Christian morality, the anti-military uh, sentiment was deeply rooted. 
but we nevertheless know that uh, pretty much since the very beginning of their consolidation, uh, Christians started to use violence against pagans, against other Christian groups. And so my question is, uh, how did, did the imperial legislation and in general, the relationship with the empire uh, sparked new public and social antagonism towards religious enemies? And did the Christian accepted these uh, imperial interference uh, in religious matters? Did they want it uh, that the state interfered within these uh, religious um, uh, questions? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's another fascinating uh, topic. It seems that the first Christian emperors issued decrees that and laws that were so uh, anti-pagan that they left uh, the population with no choice but to convert to Christianity. If you chose not to be Christian, then uh, uh, you were an inferior citizen. You had to pay more taxes. You had to face uh, violence, uh, or you had to accept that uh, the violence that other people uh, um, put on you would go unpunished. So that's another very, very interesting, the, the, the laws, the uh, anti-pagan laws that the first uh, emperors issued. And we, uh, we know them, uh, they're not um, frequently discussed because it's uh, considered a taboo, uh, but the uh, Theodosian code and the Justinian code are full of such, uh, such examples. And so we can actually say that violence became a sort of tool uh, also used to uh, persuade people to convert to Christianity uh, during the um, empire. Yes, uh, the issue of why Christianity prevailed and its success is fascinating and there were many reasons why Christianity uh, prevailed uh, and, uh, and it met with the success that it met. But one of the reasons why uh, it, uh, it was successful was uh, because of the violence. Yes, the violence against the other, first pagans and then the heretical Christians. Yes, violence is a major factor, indeed. Mm. Another um, quite broad uh, question. Um, in the moment in which the Christian church uh, became institutionalized and it uh, fully merged with the empire, which Roman or pagan violent traits, uh, traditions and or behavior, uh, behaviors were negotiated and then maybe interjected? And so what, and also actually, what went lost in this uh, process, namely, uh, which were the elements that were uh, discarded on both sides? How did the negotiation between the two sides occur? Negotiation as far as what is concerned? Sorry, I didn't quite understand uh, uh, your question. Negotiation as far as what? Uh, as far as violence, I mean, the Roman and pagan society was actually an innerly violent one. So uh, how, did this, um, how did the merging uh, between empire and religion actually took place? Which were the elements that were negotiated or discarded or interjected? Mm -hmm. uh, Rory mentioned that before, how uh, in the period uh, uh, that he presented, religion was incredibly important for the state and how these were two connected. That is something that I believe it, it was true uh, throughout antiquity for all the Mediterranean world. And that is why uh, the Romans were at first horrified uh, with the Christian incompatibility uh, to participate in the ceremonies in honor of the tradition gods and hence the persecution. Of, of, of Christians, uh, but and, and violence is, 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 is a major uh, and very interesting uh, uh, issue, uh, and um, the, it's, it's um, uh, unquestionable that the Roman uh, society was a violent world, uh, and vi today violence is more hidden. It's, it exists less, and it's more hidden. Um, um, yes, these are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't, uh, okay, I have a question for Professor Yusif. Go on, um, uh, turn on your microphone, uh, Dr. Cox, and, and ask your question. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Professor Yusuf. That was really, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I find it fascinating how how the kind of the early church ties itself in knots around this this question. I was wondering. Um, I mean, one of the people that I'm sure you're you're very familiar with is, is Ambrose, and I, I think Ambrose always gets overlooked because everyone looks at Augustine, right? Um, but actually, Ambrose, in terms of the the kind of the big hitting theologians begins to talk about justifications of violence before Augustine. And he's doing it very much, of course, from a, a Ciceronian perspective mm -hmm. and ideas about injustice. So this idea that, you know, and it's really a stoic, I guess, sense of, it, of injustice, that, that, that observing an injustice is as bad as perpetrating the injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how Ambrose kind of gets towards the justification of violence, because he says, you know, you've got to help somebody because otherwise you might as well be doing the, 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 the injury yourself. But of course, that that they don't justify self-defense, right? Because actually, the defense of self is egoistic and it's not charitable. But defense of others is charitable. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent do you think what we're seeing here is perhaps a a, a, a battle between the more what we might think of as Neoplatonic side of Christian thought, in terms mm -hmm. of a position against violence and its its emphasis on the spirit and the spirit alone? versus a more what we might think of as, as Roman, I guess, Stoic, even though Stoicism was, was of course Greek, but a more kind of Roman Stoic kind of Roman law perspective mm -hmm. towards violence that wants to kind of justify violence in terms of injustice uh, uh, and, and a defending against injustice. And, and but also, of course, imbuing that with a sense of civic duty and civic obligation. I mean, do you think there's anything there that this could be seen as a kind of Stoicism versus Neoplatonism um, battle? Yes, you're certainly right in, in your observation. So I don't have to add uh, more. You're certainly right about that. And when it, what it comes up to is that it was not an easy issue. It was very complicated and it came up to the relations of uh, uh, towards the state, the relations of the church and towards the state. But you're very right what you said, your observations concerning Ambrose and these uh, two sides of, of traditions, the Roman and the Greek. Very right, yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Cox, for your question. I think we don't have any question from um, Facebook nor any other channel. Okay, so um, I have finished my questions, actually. Maybe I have another little question for um, Dr. Cox, but it's just a brief one. We have said, um, we have talked about uh, the uh, restitution of property, how it was a motive to wage war upon a different society or population. And I was thinking about the practice of ransoming, which is also connected to Christianity. So this could also be a double question for Dr. Yosef and Dr. Cox. Um, the practice of ransoming um, was uh, uh, widespread uh, during the modern period, during the medieval period, but what about the ancient times? I'm not very familiar with that. So um, uh, I take the occasion to speak with you about this for a minute. Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course, ransoming <clears throat> only becomes popular from about the 11th or 12th centuries. Um, prior to that, you don't really get much evidence of ransoming and, and people are more likely to be executed in, in medieval warfare. Um, there isn't a huge amount of evidence for ransoming um, in the ancient world. That's not to say that people weren't spared. Um, they, you know, elites, elites were spared when when they could be useful. Um, you, what you do get is the use of hostages. So often rulers will take the sons of their vassals um, and their supposed allies into their own court, and that's both as a, a kind of a collateral against. Um, rebellion, because if there's the threat that if you rebel, your heir, your son will be executed. But it's also a way of indoctrinating people into a certain way of life. So, you know, the, the, the Hittite king will, will take people into his court. The, the Egyptians did this a lot, and they would effectively educate them and raise them in Egyptian or Hittite um, or Assyrian cultural um, mores and then 
they would be sent out as, as vassal rulers, and as, as puppet kings, effectively. Um, so that, that was certainly used. On the whole, though, actually, you know, one of the conclusions I've come to in the book is that whilst I do think a use ad bellum tradition or traditions can be identified in the ancient Near East, there is very, very little evidence of use in bellow traditions. You know, warfare was pretty just straight up brutal. Um, and there seems to be very few constraints uh, at all. There is some evidence of religious immunity in Hittite warfare, where, cert where the, the, the temples of gods will be shown some degree of mercy and priests will be show some degree of mercy. But of course, Israelite warfare doesn't show that at all. Quite the opposite. You know, they, they, they go out to exterminate other, other gods. Again, Egyptian warfare doesn't show any evidence of that either. Um, so ransoming is not particularly used. And, and, and more usually, uh, elites are theatrically executed. So this, you know, if we go back to say the Roman triumph, where you know, captured um, rebels, rulers are, were, 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 were strangled at the end of the triumph as part of a show of strength and um, power, this goes a long, long way back. And, and so elite princes who had rebelled or captured princes or kings would be ritually executed, often in quite gruesome ways. Yes, indeed, theatricality is uh, something uh, very important uh, when it came to the uh, punishment and the death of uh, whoever was thought as a criminal. Yes, it was didactic to see, to watch someone uh, die. It was for the entire community to attend and uh, definitely theatrical, both satisfaction, a performance uh, for the masses, but also a message to convey. You shouldn't go down this road because this is the fate that uh, will await you. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rory also was again right that ransoming is not a preoccupation for the sources of the period that I uh, examine. Yeah, maybe it became more popular, as he said, in uh, subsequent times. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, I think um, we have finished with the questions. And uh, um, I think that if you don't have anything else to add, uh, we can end the stream here. OK, Carlo Alberto, go on. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Cox, and uh, I'd like to ask if and how uh, the great stress posed to uh, the justness of war, also in uh, this uh, objectiveness you talked about uh, in uh, diplomatic uh, relations, uh, relationships uh, of Hati, of course, was uh, somehow transmitted to other political context in that area afterward. And uh, if uh, you can find some uh, equivalence of that in other contexts, such as the Greek or the Roman one afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, really good question. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to, to show convincing evidence. Um, but I think you can show some evidence in terms of we know that there are transmission between Hittite, well, Hurrian, then Hittite, then Greek myths, for sure. We know that there is transmission of um, figures of gods and goddesses, so figures like Ishtar travel across the Near East and end up in, um, in, in Greece uh, as, as goddesses like Aphrodite or Athena, really both of those. Um, in terms of the actual kind of legal transmission, yes, because I, I do think you, the, the evidence is that these, the, the treaties that you see in Hattie, you can see later treaties being created by say the, the Levantine states, so you know the Phoenician states, the later the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and the later Egyptian Empire, with say Mycenaean Greeks, or later, what we might think of as kind of more Hellenic Greek states, and then eventually Rome. There's a couple of very good studies by a uh, very good study by uh, uh, an author called uh, Marco Liberani, and another good study on international law um, by uh, Bederman. Uh, and, and a few others as well. And, and they, they effectively have shown or, or tried to show that in terms of the legal tradition, there is an ongoing kind of tradition of international law that really goes back to this kind of, yeah, Babylonian, um, Syrian, Hittite, Egyptian context. And it, and it does filter down. 
one of the interesting things though is that it, it shows you how it's always from a perspective though so we have a very famous example of a treaty between hit uh, between hatti and egypt um they fight a big battle at kadesh uh in the levant in 1280 and eventually they they sign a treaty a peace treaty basically because they're worried um about the rise of a number of other threats and it's the only treaty from the ancient world where we have the egyptian version which was inscribed on the walls of karnak and the hittite version which was found in hattusha and they say different things so so the egyptian version you know they, they basically you know essentially the treaty is identical but in the egyptian version the way that they talk about hattie is very derogatory they say that they've completely defeated hattie that the hittite king comes begging for peace and you know that the pharaoh you know in in his you know uh, in, in his magnanimity grants peace and they come to the following arrangements the hittite version is much less grandiose and talks and actually much more realistic um, and talks about how they come to peace shows actually quite a lot of respect to the pharaoh um, and gives a slightly different version of events and i think that's a really good example of they're both using diplomatic a, a diplomatic framework and a legal instrument that obviously both sides can share you know they they they, they negotiate this treaty and they and, and they create it so there's there's common ground there but if we only had the Egyptian source, or only had the Hittite source, our our perspective, our knowledge, our impression of that treaty, and the political events that surround it, would be very different. So I think that's you know as historians, that's something that I think we always have to be extremely you know, aware of, that we're always, always an audience, and we're always reading it from one perspective. And whether you know in, in ancient history in medieval history particularly you know we may only have that one source and so we're limited uh, mm -hmm. and it's actually when you get a multiple perspective like that you can start to see where some of the what we might think of as the history or the facts in inverted commas start to break down but yeah no there is but the, the, you know those legal instruments those traditions they survive and you can see them surviving through you know several thousand years really um, all the way, arguably, into, into Roman. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Also, I'd like to ask a question to Professor Yosef. Uh, before, you talked mostly about uh, sources from the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if also, um, before Dr. Um, Cox uh, uh, referred to St. Ambrose, of course, which was from the western part, but I also wondered if also because of the different uh, uh, political and historical outcomes of the uh, different parts of the empire. There was a, also a even slight amount of difference uh, in the in the um, um, uh, approach to this uh, theme of just war in the western part rather than in the eastern one. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I chose um, mainly the focus of my research was the early Christian years, and this happens that we have most of the sources for early Christianity from the east. It's not that I chose the Eastern sources. I chose to focus on the first Christian years and thus uh, the sources available were mostly Eastern. Uh, so it's only from a later period that we get the, the Western perspective. But may I also um, add uh, something to uh, what uh, Rory said concerning uh, the, the warning for, for uh, uh, historians, how crucial that is to keep that in mind when we read the source, that it's just one perspective that we get and we have to be extremely cautious. That's, that's a very, very important, I think, uh, uh, something to keep in mind, very important. Yeah, I mean, and just to add to that, I mean, by, by the nature of these sources, you know, we're really talking about elites. We're always mm -hmm. talking about elites. So, you know, I can, I can talk about Hittite ideas of, of war or Egyptian ideas of war or even Israelite ideas of war you know the, the Tanakh is interesting because it's perhaps it's not royal so when we're talking about Egypt um, and Hatti 
were, were either talking about royal or very high elite sources, you know, government officials, administrators, priests. The Tanakh is a bit different there because although it's elite, i.e. they're literate, you know, they're, they're probably not quite on the same level. They're not royal, you know, they're, they're priests for the most part, almost certainly, but they're not quite from the same sort of level. So that's, that's a slightly unusual source. But again, you know, mm. uh, with uh, Professor Yosef's sources, you know, th these are elites. So we can talk about this as the views of Christians or the views of the Hittites, but actually we're talking about the views of art, potentially a very, very small portion of society. Now, Absolutely. it may be that those norms were, were, were more widely accepted and, and were representative of, of culture and society more generally, but we can't say that with any measure of uh, any measure of certainty. A little male and male, if I also add, a little male and male. Exactly. Also. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Although in Egypt, there's actually some really interesting examples when you get female pharaohs like Hatshepsut and, and others, mm -hmm. where they adopt male attitudes and even regalia. Um, so they, you know, have the ritual beard. And they they portray themselves in military stances that are basically mm -hmm. identical to the male stances. So yes, yeah, as you say, it's, this is a male world, and even female rulers are forced to um, uh, forced to go along with those same portrayals, norms, and assumptions mm -hmm. in order to be powerful. Yeah. Um... This was a very interesting and fascinating discussion, I um, admit that. And um, if we don't have anything else to add... Uh, I have just one answer. I would like to ask... <laughs> don't let an me answer. Say if you don't have anything to add every time. Because <laughs> it looks like I want to end up the discussion, but I, actually I don't. So uh, mm. go on, Tomasa, thank you. So I would like to, to ask uh, to Professor Cox, uh, what do we know about the naval warfare concerning Hattie's empire? And if we know something uh, about just wars uh, applied to naval warfare? Is this a specific as a question that I give you? And of course, take your time. So what sort of warfare do you say? Naval. Naval. Uh, war uh, uh, on, uh, on sea. Oh, naval. Sorry, sorry. That's naval. <laughs> um, very little. Uh, the, the Hittites didn't like going to war at sea at all. They were very much um, a land-based army. Um, towards the end of their empire, so by the, so the 13th century BCE, they do launch a series of attacks on Cyprus. And of course, Cyprus is important because of its copper deposits. Um, and so they, and, and in the Bronze Age, copper is obviously pretty important. Um, and, but on the whole, they, if they go to war at sea, they use the navies of the, the, the Levantine city-states. So places like Ugarit and Byblos and, and Sidon and, and places like that. Um, they don't really have any naval expertise themselves. Um, and this is actually why they are quite vulnerable to the Achaeans, as they call them, or the Achaeans. Because what the Achaeans do is that they just raid that South Anatolian coast, um, penetrate in, take what they want. And by the time the Hittites have actually mustered forces, the, the, the Achiawans are gone again because they just sail away. And there's not any really evidence that the, the, the Hittites had any good way to respond to that. Um, and of course, you know, the, the intrusion of the so-called sea peoples, exactly who they are or what they were remains a question of debate. But it's the sea peoples who come from the Eastern Mediterranean, perhaps the, the Aegean, almost certainly the Aegean, um, in, in the 12th, at the end of the, the 13th century, so around 1200, that really, you know, causes the collapse of a lot of these late Bronze Age kingdoms. So, yeah, so we don't know much. As I said, it's right, the only real uh, reference we have is right at the end of the 13th century, where the Hittite king is basically saying, all these people keep on landing and, and, and invading and plundering. We've got to go and do something about it. They launch a, 
a, a, a, an expedition against Cyprus, um, but they use they use their vassals' ships, not their own. Um, and the Israelites, of course, there's no again, there's no evidence of naval warfare from from Israel, as far as I'm aware, anyway. The, the, the Egyptians, again, don't really tend, not until the, the, the much later kind of Hellenic, the Ptolemaic period, don't tend to like going to war or, or at sea. They do like waging war on rivers, though. So actually, in the Middle Kingdom the, and the Old Kingdom, it's the navy, which is seen as the elite part of the Egyptian armed forces. Um, but it's all river based. By the new kingdom, with the uh, in, with the introduction of the chariot, the light two wheel chariot, um, you have the creation of the chariotry corps, and that becomes the new elite, the new military elite of the of the new kingdom in Egypt, and that's really what that leads to the huge expansion of Egyptian empire in Syria and Palestine. And so, by the new kingdom, you've got to be in the chariotry to be an elite. Um, and so, it's shifted from the navy, the river navy to the charity. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for the question. OK, so any other question, maybe coming from Facebook or from the participants here? OK, <laughs> this time it went well, maybe. And uh, um, Professor Yassif, Professor Cox, if you want to add something, um, otherwise we will, uh, we will end this conversation and this streaming here. I just want to say uh, that um, I have had enough with um, the aristocratic male voice. So that's why I am um, exploring my new endeavor is uh, uh, to try to explore uh, the voices uh, the, the voices of females, what and especially the mottos, what they sounded in the arenas and in the public spaces, females that gather together, female crowds, not, not uh, enough with the male aristocratic, so uh, lower and uh, female uh, perspective. I thank you for this, uh, for bringing this new perspective into the study of ancient history. It's, uh, of course, necessary. Um, and uh, and it's a pleasure to know that scholars are <laughs> um, uh, scholars are taking this uh, topic uh, seriously. I mean, um, it is very important, and only lately it has been start it, it, it has been started to be studied. So um, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cox. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, having attended this um, conference. Uh, the next one will be on Friday the 20th, um, as I said, and, um, and yes, thank you again and uh, see you at the next uh, conference. Thank you very much.